Hi there, a warm welcome to the first episode of Listening to the In-Between. In this three-part podcast series by Radio Artes, we will explore various aspects of deep listening, a practice developed by the American composer, musician, writer and humanitarian Pauline Oliveros. I am your host, Joop Christenhuis. The last minute, we have been listening to an excerpt from Lear, the first track on Olivero's 1989 album, Deep Listening, that she recorded with trombonist and didgeridoo player Stuart Dempster and vocalist Panayotis. For a podcast introduction, it may have been a remarkably long fragment. Quite consciously so, as listening, particularly deep listening, requires slowing down and allowing sounds to take their own time. Only then can we begin to fully appreciate what acoustically unfolds. In this particular case, what unfolds between a recorded past and our listening present, between the music heard and our inner soundscape of sonic memories and imaginations, but also what is unfolding between three improvising musicians and their instruments, between their bodies and the nine million liters underground space of the Dan Harpel system at Fort Warden Historical State Park the location where the Deep Listening album was recorded. Now let's take another moment and get a feel of how this huge underground space not only serves as an acoustic background, but becomes a musical actor on its own thanks to its 45 second reverberation decay time. Deep listening, its connection to space and time, and the interrelations between the outer and the inner world the practice reveals through sonic awareness. These are some of the themes we will dive into in this podcast series, and on Wednesday, October 5, as artist Studium Generale, in collaboration with Corpo Real, the master interior architecture at Artes, will host a hybrid event around Pauline Olivero's deep listening practice. By collectively performing Olivero's deep listening exercise, Extreme Slow Walk, participants will get a chance to explore the acoustic space around Zwolle's Sofia Gebouw and Zwolle's Conservatory building. Additionally, 
Colombian sound artist, deep listener and academic researcher Jimena Alarcón will offer a telematic listening experience by means of her recently developed Intimal app. In 2021, we made the podcast series Sounding Places, Listening Places, which is still available at Radio Artes, by the way. In it, we explored how sound and listening can contribute to realizing a more sustainable and reciprocal relation with the earth. Back then, we already tipped our toes in the world of deep listening. In listening to the in-between, we will put this rich practice into a broader context. In our second episode, for example, deep listener Sharon Stewart will guide you through practical deep listening exercises and open up the possibility for creating our own listening scores. In the third and last, we will dive deeper into theoretical concepts related to deep listening. But first things first. In this initial episode, we'll offer an introduction, a crash course, if you like, to both the life works of Pauline Oliveros and the recent work and research of Jimela Alarcón, to whom I will speak shortly. Firstly, however, I would like to introduce Ed McKeon, a London-based researcher, music producer and occasional writer and broadcaster on contemporary music, who describes himself as a musician who neither performs nor composes. Ed is a lecturer at Goldsmith University London and as co-director of Third Ear Music works with musicians and artists at the point where music shares a space with other art disciplines, where music in disciplines, as he likes to say. In the past 20 years he has collaborated with artists such as Tony Rowe, Tin Man and the Telephone, Brian Eno, Evan Parker, Heiner Goebbels, Robert Ashley and notably Pauline Oliveros, who also plays an important role in his doctoral research that he recently completed at Birmingham City University. A link to his PhD thesis Making Art Public, Musicality and the Curatorial can be found in the show notes of this episode. Hello Ed, a good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our podcast. Yep, it's very good to uh, meet you again. My pleasure. Um, well, uh, to start, uh, as you are very well acquainted with Pauline Oliveros and her work, uh, would you be so kind as to give our listeners a short introduction about who she was? Of course. So Pauline was um, born in Houston in Texas in 1932, and she passed away in 2016 in her home in Upper State, New York. So that's um, uh, when she was around with us in person. She played French horn early on, an accordion. Her mother um, taught piano, her grandmother may have taught piano as well. Uh, a somewhat musical family. But um, she's a real pioneer. And as such, she was really ahead of the game. She, she was doing things 70 years ago that still seem very current now. So, for example, one of the things that she started to do in the very late 1950s, encouraged by her composition teacher in San Francisco, Robert Erickson, was to set up a free improvisation group with the composer Terry Riley and with Lauren Rush. Um, I think it may also have involved Stuart Dempster at times. And this was in a sense the first, um, uh, outside of the field of jazz, it was the first free improv group. And in fact, I came across some recordings of that not so long ago, which are online. And listening to them, I thought I could have gone to you know, various venues I know that, that regularly present free improv. I could have gone to that last week and it would have sounded as fresh last week as it did uh, when she was making it um, over 60 years ago. And it was astonishing. <laughs> pioneer of using a variety of different technologies, particularly recording technologies, using tape delay, for example, but also resonance, spatializing sound. And she also was a pioneer of what became what has become known as telematic performance. Mm, and this uh, specific term, the telematic, uh, could you elaborate on this for our listeners? Um, you and I now are in different parts of the world speaking simultaneously through a virtual platform. It's that, but it was, it predates the internet by decades. 
And it, it's fascinating to see the way that musicians were pushing at the very limits of technology in order to be able to uh, explore how certain kinds of um, uh, music might be possible and might be made in conditions that we are now beginning to normalize. And she was doing it from the, uh, certainly the, the early 1980s. And she was still pushing at the edges of that right until um, she passed away in her mid, in her mid 80s um, in 2016. She was um, really pushing into technology. She, she had, she'd done performances on Second Life. You know, she had a, an ensemble that she played in on Second Life. In fact, let's listen to an excerpt from a performance of the Avatar Orchestra Metaverse in Second Life. You can find a link to the entire recording with video in the show notes of this episode. As Pauline Oliveros herself describes in her well-known book Deep Listening, a Composer's Sound Practice, first published in 2005, her pioneering in early electronics led her to a teaching position at the University of California, San Diego in 1967. Apart from establishing an electronic music program, she began teaching a course called The Nature of Music. Oliveros writes, this course was hands-on. Every student was expected to compose and improvise, even though most had no musical training. End of quote. To provide her students with teaching materials, she composed Sonic Meditation, a series of simple text scores, that is, written instructions that could be performed by persons without musical training. In Oliveira's own words, Sonic meditations are based on patterns of attention. In other words, these pieces are ways of listening and responding. End of quote. The initial set of 12 sonic meditations was published in a journal called Source Magazine in 1970. To those were added a further set of 12 that were published in 1974. In many ways, the sonic meditations can be understood as the basis for Oliveira's deep listening practice that she started to develop in the years following. Many years later, in 1999, Oliveros established the first official deep listening retreat at the Rose Mountain Retreat Center in New Mexico, together with writer, therapist and dream listener Ioni and movement professional Heloise Gold. I asked Ed if he could elaborate on some important characteristics of deep listening in terms of attitudes to sound and listening. Um, I can try. I, I got to know her mainly at the very end of her life, um, really from 2014 onwards. and. She was saying even then, I'm still learning what deep listening is. So deep listening is not, um, there isn't a, a menu or a recipe that says, you know, it's these five things. And if you do these five things, it's deep listening. And if you don't do these five things, it's not deep listening. Deep listening is a, it's a, a constant process of learning what listening is and can be. So um, a couple of things. One is um, she was given a tape recorder by her mother in 1952. She, um, so there's a story that she would tell um, often of uh, leaving it hanging outside the apartment window in San Francisco, listening, and then playing the tape back a little while later and hearing all sorts of things on the tape that she hadn't realised that she'd heard, but had heard. This is part of, a, I think, a, a beginning of realising that our listening is you know, we're, we're, is a, a more complicated procedure than um, we might ordinarily take for granted. And that in a way, um, we can become like microphones. So there is a mode of listening, which is just open to the environment and soaking up all sorts of sounds that we might not be absolutely conscious of paying attention to. But nevertheless, it's part of our field of experience. So that's one aspect. Another way of appreciating um, the move that she made in towards listening is through the experimental um, music scene in the States uh, in particular. And I'm thinking, uh, I, I, I don't want to reduce this to John Cage, but Cage is a, is a well-known and familiar figure within, um, within music and within the arts more broadly. 
And I think it can be understood that she took two very particular lessons from key works of his in 1952 and 1962. So the first is four minutes, 33 seconds, um, you know, uh, Cage's um, manifestation that there is no such thing as silence. And if there is no such thing as silence, then music becomes a product of a mode of listening or a type of listening. So it begins to draw attention that music or musical value is going to come or emerge as a product of a certain kind of listening. And the other 10 years later, Cage created a piece called Zero Minutes, Zero Zero Seconds, or his subtitle for it was um, Four Minutes 33, Number Two. And this involved, a, a, it's a determined action um, caught, captured with contact microphones. Uh, in this instance, when he first presented it at Brandeis University, I think he was writing letters to uh, various people whilst on a creaky chair, and the, the, the contact microphones were picking up these different sounds and, uh, and relaying them to an audience. But the demonstration was that there was no such thing as inactivity. So one way of thinking that in terms of listening is that that mode of open or passive, or what might previously be thought of as passive listening, where we just in a sense, make us allow ourselves to be open to the field of sounds around us, isn't inactive at all. It's not passive at all. There is a, a, a mode of activity. It's a mode of meditation um, for I think people who experience meditative practice, which involves a voluntary letting go of certain kinds of control mechanisms that um, uh, we produce mentally and bodily, and allowing ourselves to be open to experience. So those two lessons together, I think, begin to coalesce in some ways around what becomes the practice of deep listening. Now that we have heard about some of the backgrounds of Oliveira's deep listening practice, it is time to zoom in on the Extreme Slow Walk, an exercise that will be collectively performed on October 5, 2022. In short, the Extreme Slow Walk is an exercise that became a regular part of the deep listening practice and workshops. A decisive aspect in the genesis of the Extreme Slow Walk were Oliveira's collaborations with Elaine Summers, an American dancer, choreographer and yoga practitioner who in the 1960s developed a moving practice which she called kinetic awareness. In fact, as becomes clear from the instruction of the exercise, the Extreme Slow Walk is all about moving consciously. Let me read the instructions quickly. Moving as slowly as possible. Step forward with the heel to the ground first. Let the weight of the body shift along the outside edge of the foot to the small toe and across to the large toe. As the weight of the body fully aligns with that foot, then begin the transition of shifting to the other foot. Small steps are recommended as balance may be challenged. Maintain good posture with shoulders relaxed and head erect. Use your breathing. In my conversation with Ed, I asked him about his own experiences with the extreme slow walk. His answer turned out to be a wonderful contemplation on the notion of simultaneity and how the exercise allows us to physically attune to the spatial and temporal dimensions of a given place. In her commentary she says, the purpose of the exercise is to challenge your normal pattern or rhythm of walking so that you can learn to reconnect with very subtle energies in the body as the weight shifts from side to side in an extreme slow walk. You may discover the point to point connections of movement and or the merging into the experience of flow. So point to point connections of movement, you might think of as a kind of focused walking, uh, a sense of a line or moving in line and an opening to flow, uh, a sense of um, just being moved, uh, rather than necessarily being the agent, rather than, the, rather than going back to this dualistic notion that there is a, a, an interior self that is instructing the legs to move my right leg, now move my left leg, um, almost like there's a, a computer programmer somewhere that's telling me to move, you know, uh, using my body like a puppet. It's, it's two movements happening simultaneously, one of which the, the one leg is in a more relaxed mode or being acted on, and the other one is in a more attention mode, which is resisting gravity and is, is lifting itself up. The two steps are moving in tandem. It's a really odd experience because we walk all the time without thinking about it. But when you strip it back and you try to do it as slowly as possible, you suddenly realize there are all of these things going on at the same time. So that's one aspect. Another way of understanding the extreme slow walk is, uh, this is my terminology, 
or shorthand rather than something Pauline said, but it's a way of thinking on our feet. I think there are dimensions to this which are, um, we tend to think of walk um, on a flat surface, again, which moves in a line from one place to another. But the extreme slow walk emphasizes, or the experience of doing an extreme slow walk also emphasizes that a walk is vertical or moves in that dimension as well. And that that dimension has, um, in philosophical terms, Heidegger talks about skies and earths. Um, it's, it produces a relationship to, to place in terms of what is the history of this place that I'm, you know, the, the, the ground that I take to be a ground also has a time and has a history. And it's something which I can connect with and I can feel um, through my feet and through the place that I'm in. I've not stopped listening. I'm also, whilst I'm walking, I'm also listening and attending to how I situate myself, that what we call proprioception, um, how I understand my position within an environment, particularly as a mobile figure within a, an, within a landscape. So there is an awareness of self in relation to place on multiple levels, um, which happens in the process of, of a walk. And it's something that when we slow down, we can begin to attend to in a much more um, heightened fashion. Thank you so much for this ad. I'm sure we will uh, further contemplate on these notions of simultaneity and attunement in the third episode of Listening to the In-Between. For the second half of this episode, I am happy to introduce Jimena Alarcón, who on October 5 will guide us through a telematic listening experience by means of her recently developed Intimal app. Jimena was born in Bogota, where she originally studied social communication, after which she moved to Europe, where she works as a sound artist and academic researcher, focusing on listening to in-between sonic spaces, such as underground transport systems, dreams and the context of human migration, or what she calls sonic migrations. Jimena did a PhD in music, technology and innovation at De Montfort University in Leicester and was a researcher at CRISAP, Creative Research into Sound Arts Practice at the University of the Arts London. Thanks to the Mary Sklodowska Curie Fellowship, she then researched embodied music cognition methods at Ritmo, the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Rhythm, Time and Motion at the University of Oslo. It was here that she developed Intimal, a telematic interface for relational listening and sonic migrations, a project which we will discuss shortly. In tandem with her artistic research, Jimena is an avid deep listener. After getting acquainted with Pauline Oliveros and deep listening in 2008, she completed the three-year certificate program. Since then, she worked as a certified deep listening tutor in various parts of the world. Hi, Jimena. A very warm welcome to our podcast. Yes, thank you, Job, for this invitation. Jimena, uh, given your work as a certified deep listener, I'm very curious to know more about your collaborations with Pauline Oliveros and also what you deem to be the most valuable insights that deep listening brought you. Um, I met her in 2008. Uh, she was invited uh, by Ron Herrema to the Montfort University. Basically, it was a week of teaching. Uh, Pauline was teaching uh, workshops and also doing kind of master class. And I had the big fortune to be there. I was working and I also had the privilege of um, helping in practical things to, to Pauline. So just taking her to wherever she wanted to be in the city and, you know, these practical things that were. So we had lots of times of conversation apart from the formal, for the formal informal workshops and, and the masterclass. So in my case, in 2003 to 2007, doing my PhD, I never came across her work. I was kind of influenced more by the Acoustic Ecology School from um, Armour Ray Schaefer and Barry Truex. Um, and uh, what was very interesting is that immediately when she started to just asking me, what do I do? 
I started to change my perception of sound <laughs> after so many years of uh, being in sound in listening, uh, because I felt that she brought a non-judgmental approach to listening and to sound. Um, the word noise was not part of her vocabulary necessarily, while the word noise was part of the vocabulary of the other school. So that that started to change um, uh, a lot, particularly in, in the effects of sound, as if it was something super external. And she brought for me the inner listening, which was something that I already had in my ethnographic work with commuters. Uh, because when I asked about sound, people were asked, were telling me about their inner self. <laughs> uh, but I didn't have uh, a practice or a theory that was supporting that at that time. Um, so she started to bring all of that. And, and that is not something that you, you can reduce and you can objectify, uh, but it's something more fluid. So I learned that a lot <laughs> from her. Another aspect of Oliveira's work that proved to be of influence was her pioneering work in the fields of telematics. As Ed explained earlier, telematic performances are live performances that make use of communication technologies to distribute the performance between two or more locations. It was precisely this notion of listening and sounding collectively at a distance that Alarcon began to pursue in her own work, of course adapting the concept to her own artistic needs and interests. When I met her, I was already developing some improvisations, uh, collocated, uh, networked improvisations. Uh, but for me, still the, the idea of uh, transmitting sound, bidirectional sound, uh, I needed to, to know more about the technology. So I started to work with the technology that she was working, Jack Trip. Um, which is still the most advanced uh, telematic technology to transmit bidirectional sound or multidirectional sound uh, in high quality with low la latency. But I started to create my own, let's say, style of telematic performances. And I was working with non-musicians and I started to create more improvisatory games, listening games, listening and sounding, in a telematic way, very influenced by Pauline deep listening and uh, adapting some of her scores. All I start to adapt for the idea of migration, being an economic and cultural migrant. <laughs> I was born in Bogota, Colombia, and I have lived a total of 22 years um, of my life outside my country, uh, in Barcelona, in England and in Norway. And I start to listen to my migration and I engage in, in the making of telematic sonic performances um, with people who have experienced migration. When I asked Arkon about the sonic properties of this migratory journey, she explained that acoustic memories are fundamental to people's perception of space, of time and even their perception of their own self. We all carry sonic memories of earlier stages in our life with us. You may have traveled from a village to a city or the other way around with their own sonic landscape stored somewhere in your mind and body. For migrants, having lived parts of their lives in different parts of the world, the rift between their former home and their present surroundings is particularly sharp, to the point in which they turn out to be irreconcilable, Alarcon explains. If you have lived for, for some time in another geography, when you move, from, from one geography to other to live, um, it's a big change. It's a big change for the body and for the mind, just the geographical experience, but also the cultural experience. You need to, to settle. So you need to bring about all the coordinates that you have before, all the reference that you have before and make them here. But that never happens fully. <laughs> that is my experience of migration. And there is something of the body that wants to go back and you keep remembering the other. Migrants refer to that as a limbo. It's emotional limbo as 
You are neither there, you are neither here. So this is what I wanted to explore creatively with telematic performances and with deep listening. And then I engaged in the last years with Intimal in my creating my own technology to, to perform or to experience what I call a migratory journey. Speaking of Intimal again, let's dive a bit deeper in this project of Alarcon's, which on our site she describes as a physical, virtual, embodied system for relational listening that explores the body as an interface that keeps memory of place in the context of human migration. That surely is quite a mouthful, so let's try to break that down a bit. In short, we can think of Intimal as a telematic software environment that, through improvisation and deep listening techniques, allows participants in different parts of the world to collectively explore this migratory limbo that Alarcon spoke about earlier. In doing so, it reconnects people's inner soundscapes to their actual acoustic environments. Important to note here is that Intimal is not only about sound and listening. Although these are surely important aspects, Arcon emphasizes that Intermol is an embodied system. I had the question of embodiment. So the, the body was, is so, so important in deep listening, in the workshops that are not telematic, so physically. But I say, what do I do with the body when I'm in, in this space, in this telematic space? In fact, this question of embodiment became the focus of her artistic research between 2017 and 19, when a grant from the Mary Sklodowska Curie Fellowship enabled her to do a research project at RITMO, the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Rhythm, Time and Motion at the University of Oslo. In the motion capturing studio of the Institute, Alarcon experimented with movement and breathing sensors, which enabled intimal participants to trigger various sound materials, ranging from synthetic sound waves to recordings of environmental sounds and fragments from oral migratory testimonies. So in the intimal system, I started to interrelate body movement, voice, language, a memory, memory of place, uh, of of soil, geography, um, and also oral archives. So I wanted a, a technological system that allows people to improvise in the making of all these relationships, in the physical place where they are, and in the virtual space. Eventually, that that created the Intimal system for relational listening. So far, so good. But then, in March 2020, the COVID pandemic came. And with the pandemic, um, well, first I wanted to communicate what I did in Oslo, but I couldn't because the technology, uh, I didn't have the breathing sensors anymore. So I needed to change the material of work. I needed to change the technology. And I became a resident in a place called The Studio, supported by Bath Spa University. Uh, a resident as an individual worker and um, an artist. And I said, well, I'm going to do an app. <laughs> an app, a very simple app that tries to bring together all, all of that. And this is how the Intimal app was born. So just also to clarify first to the listeners, the Intimal app, as it is at the moment, is a more a, an environment, is becoming again an environment which invites people to perform a migratory journey uh, or to experience a migratory journey. And that means people can walk, people with the app can walk, and the walking, the rhythm of walking makes a sound, makes a, a wave sound. And if many people are walking in distant locations connected in the same space, they could listen to each other's wave produced by the walking rhythm. Also, people can record experience with a microphone and these recordings are saved in the app in different uh, locations, north, west, east and south. That helps to listen to the recording to others' experiences. 
To conclude this first introductory episode of listening to the in-between, let's have a sneak preview, or a pre-listen actually, of the intimal walk that is on the program for October 5. The following excerpt is from a composition called Dreaming While Awake, that Alarcon recently made for the Earth Model Day Telematic Festival, based on materials of a telematic improvisation session with the Intimal app. Thank you so much for listening to Listening to the In-Between, a radio artist podcast series in which we explore deep listening, its connection to space and time, and the interrelations between the outer and the inner world that the practice reveals through sonic awareness. In this first episode, we have been listening to Ed McKeon and Jimena Aracon, who introduced us to the life of Pauline Oliveros and the world of deep listening. We will meet the two of them again in the third and last episode of Listening to the In-Between, in which we will explore and unpack relevant theoretical concepts. In the meantime, don't forget to listen to our second episode, in which deep listener Sharon Stewart will guide you through practical deep listening exercises and open up the possibility for creating our own listening scores. Listening to the In-Between was commissioned by Artist Studium Generale, Concept, Miriam Zegers. Interviews and voiceovers by Sharon Stewart and myself, Joop Christenus. Editing and sound production by Dennis Gaans of Ondercast. Hope to welcome you again in our next episode.